husband says no. He's the one that can bust a move, not me. I'll bust something else. It won't be a move. It'll be a hip or something. Good to see you. How y'all doing? Good. We're going to continue this series of Fruitful Life this morning. I'm glad to be here with you. Last week, Pastor Bob kicked us off. Love, joy, and peace. It was amazing. And um, we are going to continue. We all want a fruitful life. Amen? Amen. It's what we all want. It's why we named the women's ministry Flourish, because that's what we all want to do. We might call it by some other name, but we all want to bear fruit that remains. And... um, make a difference in the world. I hope you'll join us Saturday. Flourish many here at the campus at 9 a.m. We're, we're going to have a beautiful bagel bar out, out there, so come hungry. Uh, if you've never been to a bagel bar, it's really fun. There's all kind of toppings. You can kind of choose savory or sweet or strawberry cream cheese. I love talking about food in the third service because <laughs> I haven't eaten yet, and so I get a little hungry. You know, that toasty bagel when you put butter on it first. <laughs> And uh, so we'll have a bagel bar, and we're going to have gifts for everyone and a sneak peek at the vision for this year's conference. Um, So I'm excited to share that with you. Our own LT is going to be speaking that morning as well. We've got a lot of ministry happening that day prepared for you, and um, we're just excited to be able to have a time to just connect as women, see what God's got prepared for us here in McKinney, what He's going to do this year in this house. And um, how many of you know, when you get the women on board, you've got a lot of good news to share. Amen? And we're going to have a great time. So Saturday, 9 to noon is what we're looking at. Bring your young girls, too. We've got fun things for the the little girls. Um, Little, I'm saying, you know, kids and tweens and teens, and they'll enjoy it. Um, They're actually going to be doing a photo shoot they can participate in, the young girls, for the Flourish Conference. So... They can come ready to strike a pose, and they'll see themselves up on the screen at the Flourish Conference and maybe on the windows and everywhere else. So we want to we highlight the fruit God has blessed us with in this house. Amen? Some beautiful young ladies. So Flourish Mini this weekend, I hope you'll be with us, and um, we'll, it fits right in with the Fruitful Life series. So the fruit of the Spirit, we get a list of what those are from Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The NIV says it like this, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So the fruit of the spirit is broken into three sets of three. So love, joy, and peace, we covered last week. That's God's gift to us, and then our gifts to others are the three we're going to cover today, forbearance, kindness, and goodness, and then the last three gifts that are named are our gifts to God, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So essentially, it's inward-focused, love, joy, and peace, and then outward-focused, forbearance, kindness, goodness, and then upward-focused with faithfulness and gentleness and self-control grows the kingdom. Galatians 5, and 24 from the message is a really beautiful modern way of breaking down these words that we read as the fruit of the Spirit. So I'm going to read this for you. It says, but what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives, much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity, We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. That sounds like almost like a a job description requirement, doesn't it? Sounds like these, this is the needs and requirements for a believer. God is listing this for us to say this is the bio, in essence, of what I'm expecting out of you. Because when I created Adam and Eve and put them in the garden, their, their primary obligation to me was to cultivate, to keep and to tend the garden is what God required of them. 
He equipped them to do it, though. He didn't just ask them to do something they weren't prepared to do. He made them well able to do it. So to tend something and to keep it is to, to lean in to what it is you are growing, to study it, to watch it. Does it need more sun? Does it need more shade? Does it need more water? Does it need to be pruned? Do I need to take a sampling from this? Do I need to make sure the soil is cultivated and broken up around the root system? What can I do to cause this to not just maintain its growth, but to thrive? If you've owned anything at all in life, from a toy to a car to a home, whatever it is, you know that nothing maintains itself, right? Everything falls into degradation under the curse of sin. Things do not become better. They don't, they don't get better. That's why I have such trouble with evolution is, is it, we would be more likely, it's said, to, to see a, a tornado run through a trash heap and build a 747 that flies than to see, you know, a human life in all of its beauty and 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 perfection, the way that our body systems work together, that does not happen on its own. It's intelligent design, right? So God has given us a mandate and an anointing to maintain, to tend things, to maintain them, not just so that they um, are efficient in what they are, but so that they grow and they produce after their own kind, right? So when we look at the fruit of the Spirit, and we're going to go through three in just a minute, they're important to us. They're valuable to us, not just to us as believers, because we know that, that they can change the world. You know, we celebrate in the church much more highly we, we celebrate and admire the gifts of the Spirit over the fruit of the Spirit. And I think we're off base. Because living and working in the kingdom for as long as I have, I've never seen the gifts of the Spirit save a marriage. I've never seen miracles, signs, and wonders raise children that follow the Lord. But I've seen the fruit of the Spirit do those things. How many husbands in this room can say that you don't want your wife prophesying over you after she just bit your head off? (laughs) Say, go take your prophecy and shove it. I just want you to be kind. Can you just be not? Come on, man. Say amen. I'm picking on the women for a minute. But come on. Who needs prophecy? Who needs revelation and teaching when you can't be nice? Right? And the world knows that. The world sees that. They're looking at the church going, are you kidding? You want to be swirled up and wrapped up in a cloud and have glitter in your hair like dandruff and look for, I mean, there's churches that are looking for the miracle signs and wonders, but I've never seen glitter, gold glitter in your hair save your relationship when, the, when you don't show the fruit of the Spirit at home. The fruit of the Spirit will change the world. We've had revivals come in and out of our world over and over and essentially has moved us one point closer to the kingdom. I have close friends that I went to Lee University with that they ended up being a a major part of a revival that happened in Pensacola. And um, I I knew the the steps previous to that where the pastor had been to Toronto. They'd gone to several other revivals and they felt that God had really called them to bring that to their area. And after it was said and done and everything, all the people were gone and I talked to them, they essentially felt like their city was probably in worse shape than it had been before. Why? Because it, people were coming from all over the world to encounter something, but the, the people, the neighbors right down the street, were, they weren't encountering long suffering from these believers. They weren't encountering kindness and goodness. They were encountering impatient people who were angry and mean to the waiters in the city and and run over people's cats and dogs and come in and make a mess and leave and tear up the building and make, it, it's like the fruit of the spirit, that makes the difference. That's what takes notice. Stephen and I, Pastor Stephen, were talking yesterday about this message and I said, you know, it's funny, we're talking about, you know, patience and kindness and goodness. 
But it's almost talking, it's almost like preaching a message about a negative space. It's difficult to do that because um, when you're talking about these three elements, we, we, don't, we don't know when someone has been patient with us. We don't see that. Uh, I saw this, we were on vacation this last week, and I saw a lot of times people would, would step right in front of an older couple, and there were a lot of ages all together at this place where we were vacationing, and, and, er, and the old people were, were on scooters, and one of them ran over my foot uh, with a scooter, and there was just all, a bunch of little kids trying to get to a pool, and it was a lot of things, a lot of people all in a, in a closed space, and I was able to watch how much patience, these older people. Everybody thought they were being patient with the elderly. It was the elderly who were trying to just enjoy a vacation and realized the young people were missing the point. And uh, I, I remember watching that, just going, you know, what? We, we, we don't know all the times that we've stepped in front of someone and they could have been angry with us or short with us, but they weren't, right? You don't see all of that. It's hard to talk about kindness, patience, and long-suffering and and goodness, um, and we all know we need it, but we only really see it when it's not there. We really see it when it's missing, right? Like the man who didn't get his luggage last night at the airport and made sure everyone knew about it. And we all didn't have our luggage either, but I'm like, oh, you're real important. You've got somewhere to be, and you're more important than everybody else in this room uh, that didn't get their luggage as well. But he wanted to yell at every person that worked at, at, at DFW to make sure that they knew that he was inconvenienced. And, and I thought, you know what? He's probably not connected to the kingdom. I hope he's not. <laughs> he's probably not, though, because he's not showing much of the fruit of the Spirit. And there's been times when my flesh has been showing, and I need to tuck it back in. Just last week, I was supposed to meet with Lisa, and, and uh, she's here on the front row. And, I was, and I, we had a misunderstanding. I thought I had moved that meeting to Friday. And I was on my way here, but I was still about 30 minutes out. And I was already 30 minutes late. My assistant called me and said, we're here waiting for you. Where are you? And I said, wait, I thought that meeting was Friday. Um, and so I started to panic. I spilled coffee on my lap. I didn't have time to get any food. So I knew my blood sugar was low. And I knew I had back-to-back -back meetings the whole day. So I thought, this is going to be horrible. It's going to be a domino effect. And now I've got stained jeans and I've got this whole situation. I feel like a failure. You know, I, I don't want someone to feel like they're not important or a priority to me. And so I, I was 30 minutes out and I got a really bad attitude. My husband, he uh, texted me and he said, I hope you have a great day. Love you. And uh, I'll be praying for you. And I texted him back, your prayers didn't work. God didn't hear you. <laughs> I'm already having a bad day. We need to all go to bed and start over. That's how bad I feel about this day right now. And my daughter was in the car with me and I just got kind of quiet for a while and I'm sitting there and, and I, was, I was thinking, um, I didn't really tell him God didn't hear his prayers, okay? <laughs> Y'all, just clarify that. People that don't know me, uh, I just said, uh, please, thank you for the prayer. Uh, but I, I knew in that moment, I had a choice. I saw myself in a scenario. I can walk in, you know, a flurry of of emotion and um, make it all about me and the fact that I failed and I can let this ruin the day or I can walk in, I can humble myself and I can apologize and I don't have to give my assistant the side eye because I think she made the mistake or whoever made the mistake. I, I can let it go. I can, I can change the course of the day. I have a choice. And it's like the Lord showed me in that situation. I had time. Um, I had time to grow some fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> so by the time I showed up, I came in, I just apologized and felt so bad. And what had transpired, because I wasn't there, she was going to tell me her whole story. And there's something that we're working on for the future. And because I wasn't there to hear it, my assistant came up with a great idea to, to tape her talking so she could go ahead and tell the story. And what came out of that that's so beautiful, that's a God thing, that's not an Amy thing, is that I've had that recording now so that I've been able to listen to it over and over. And I keep getting more and more from that story. And the Lord's shown me how much more he's planned on using what it is she was going to tell me. Well, what's interesting about that is if I'd have been there, we wouldn't have recorded it and I would have heard it and I would have missed God's goal. See, a lot of times we get angry with, with things that get in our way of our goal 
And I, I recognized when I was driving here that day that, that God's going, all right, Amy, I could have made sure that you didn't miss the meeting and that you, you weren't late. I, I'm God, after all. I could have alerted you. You could have been ready 30 minutes earlier. You're putting all of this on yourself and not recognizing the fact that this isn't all about you. Stop making it about you. You want to ruin the whole day? Go ahead. You can do that. It can be a bad day all day long if you'd like it to be. Or you can realize that I allowed this for a purpose and just step in through humility and, and, and not give your flesh any room to take advantage I don't always make that choice, but in that, I recognize I let that meeting kind of roll. The next one came. We had several flourish meetings, and the day ended up being wonderful and productive and beautiful because I realized that every time I blow it, when I really fail, when I have a short fuse when I should have had a long fuse, when I'm unkind or I say something sharp or I don't, I don't show goodness when I could have, when I back it up, right, because I didn't have fruit, when I needed it, when I back it up to what I should have done before the season I needed the fruit, I look at what's lacking. And what's been lacking for me is love. Always goes back to love. Because if, if love, joy, and peace are God's gifts to me, then they're essentially seeds he puts in my hands. I can do something with those seeds. I could just eat them. Now, I heard a fable. It's not, it's not from the Bible. It's not a parable. It's just a legend. It's an old story. But it's about a man who gave three kernels of corn to three of each of his servants. The first kernel he gave them to, the man soaked them in milk and ate them like cereal. He's hungry. Couldn't wait. The second man planted the three kernels. He had three stalks of corn that grew and three ears from each corn. He fed his family for a week. The third man, though, planted the three kernels of corn. He grew three stalks of corn with three, with three heads of corn, uh, three ears of corn each. And then he, he cleared the corn of kernels and he planted those kernels again. And he did this over and over until he had acres and acres of corn. And this is what the Lord has shown me through that scenario with the, the fruit of the Spirit is that when God deposits in our life love, joy, and peace, we can often not really take the nourishment and nutrition in that we need to for the love of God. We want to produce it when it's time to produce it, but we haven't really received it ourselves. And when I find that I've really missed the mark, it's because I was afraid of something. Like when I was late for my meeting with Lisa and I spilled coffee on myself, I, f I was afraid because I felt like she would feel like she wasn't a priority to me. I, I was afraid because it could appear that I was disorganized or a mess. My life was in chaos. I was afraid because of how it made me feel about myself, how it made me look. But what I know about the Bible is that it says perfect love casts out fear. So love and fear can't dwell together. So when I miss the mark and I'm not kind or I'm sharp with someone, I'm not forbearing, I'm not patient, when I back it up, I look at the fact that I haven't actually been patient with myself. I haven't shown love to myself. I actually didn't give myself enough grace to know mistakes happen, miscommunication happens, it's okay. It isn't, it isn't mean that everybody thinks that I lay in bed until five minutes before a meeting and roll out and put my hair in a messy bun and whatever they might think, whatever judgmental, it doesn't mean that. But once I receive love and I hold on to it, like the man who's, who got the three kernels of corn and he planted it instead of eating his seed, right? He held on to it. It, it did something long lasting for him. Now, you don't have to wait weeks and years to produce the fruit of the Spirit, but if you'll let it do its perfect work, if you'll hold on to love, joy, and peace and not let anything take it from you, then you're, when you get to need to produce the fruit of the Spirit, you'll have everything you need to produce that. It comes forth on its own. If I had a, a lemon tree right here and I looked at the lemon tree and I said, you know what, I, it's supposed to be bearing fruit. There's no fruit. I want fruit. You know, I can't bribe the lemon tree to produce a lemon for me, to make myself look good, to make you happy. I can't manipulate the fact that I don't have any fruit. 
The only way I can become fruitful is to back up to the season previously and look at what I should have been doing beforehand. I can't squeeze it out at the last minute. It's not how the fruit of the Spirit works. I have to work in advance. So if you want your life to be fruitful in the next season, if you want to have more than enough kindness, you want to have more than enough, not a short temper, long-suffering in the Greek means uh, long tempered. It means you don't have a short fuse. You're not hot headed. You don't crack and break and uh, blow up at every little thing that happens, but you have forbearance. If you want more of that, then you've got to back up and go, okay, if I want to produce the fruit, I have to connect the dots. You know, and you and I, we have no trouble doing this in every other area of our lives, but somehow when it comes to the super spiritual stuff, we get, ooh, Ooh, only God knows. No, if God is anything, he is practical. He always connects the dots. This is why the examples he gives us is fruit of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit, there is mystery attached to that. It's a gift. You don't know where he got it. You don't know when he'll give it to you. You don't know where it came from. You just say thank you. But when it is fruit, he says, I've given you seed. I gave you love. I gave you joy. I gave you peace. Now it's up to you. You're going to have to cultivate Adam and Eve. I want the rest of the world to be replenished. I want it to look like your life. What if God said that to you right now? Would the world look better than it does right now if the rest of the world looked like your life just like that? Because you are called to cultivate, to tend the spirit. Now, if if I want to lose weight and I want a better body, I know what I need to do to do that, right? Connect the dots. I know I need to cut calories. I know I need to increase movement. I know I might need to go to the gym. We can make those jumps, right? If you want a better job, you know often I might need a better education. I might need some opportunities. If I want a better, a better education, I might need to discipline myself. I might need to attend class. I might need to take some tests. We know how to connect the dots when it comes to anything else in our lives. Whether or not we do connect the dots is a different sermon. But we know that there are dots. But when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit, we leave out all of those middle connections We just want a breakthrough. When we don't have the patience for somebody, we want God to miraculously intervene and fix relationships that we've broken. And God is saying, but I gave you love, joy, and peace. When I was diagnosed with cancer, the Lord showed me a picture. You know those really big, um, they're they're like a beach ball sort of, uh, or playground ball they would sell at Walmart. They're like $1.99 or whatever, and they're big plastic, they're kind of marbly looking. And he showed me a picture of me holding a really large pink ball. And he he gave me this picture as I was walking through the lobby of the cancer treatment center. And the Lord said to me that morning, Amy, you're gonna gonna sit in meetings and you're gonna hear some things and you're gonna have a choice all day. What you picture yourself holding, this pink ball, it takes up all the space in your arms. You have no room for anything else. But that's love, joy, and peace. Now, when you go meet with the oncologist, she's going to try to hand you a piece of paper. And that piece of paper is going to have a diagnosis. It's going to have fear attached to it. And you're going to have a choice. Are you going to let go of the piece that you're holding to take that piece of paper? Are you going to hold on to what you have? And I remember sitting and almost sitting like a pregnant person on the paper in those examination rooms, realizing I can... I can take what you're giving me, but if I take that, you're going to take my peace. And I'm not going to let go of what I'm holding on to. I'm holding on to the peace of God. I won't let it go. I can't hold on to that outcome and this one at the same time. And this is my responsibility. He gave me love, joy, and peace. He didn't leave me abandoned. He's here with me right now, and I've got it, and I am not letting it go. I'm walking out of here today. I may not have my hair, but I'm going to have this ball. I may not have other body parts, but you ain't taking my piece. You might take other pieces of me, but you ain't taking this piece. 
If you have that picture in your mind when you walk into any encounter, whether it's racial prejudice and it's ugly hatred, whatever it is, you can say, I, I'm sorry, my hands are full right now. I've got the peace of God. I don't have any room to hold on to drama that you're bringing to this situation. I, I can't carry that and carry these. I got to hold on to this. That's the picture God gave me. And as I walked through the valley of the shadow of death, I thought, you know what? How can you be afraid of anything when you have a big pink beach ball? <laughs> God's promising me there's a playground on the other side of this valley. And that's where he's leading me. I got to hold on to this because I'm going to need it. I've got some play time ahead of me. Some of you need to hear that in this season because the fruit of the spirit helps us deal with delay. When things don't happen the way that we want them to happen or when we feel like they should happen or how we feel like they should happen and we don't have the kindness, we don't have the goodness. You know, I, I feel like preaching on this is similar to an infomercial. When we watch those infomercials late night on TV or we're at the state fair, that's where I get hooked by those infomercial things because they do all this cooking and or they have knives that can cut through leather and refrigerator doors. And I'm like, wow, I need that knife. I just want to cut a lemon, but hey, I need that. I'm sold. Take my money. Where's the 1-800 number? Wake up, Stacy. Turn on the clapper. Let's, let's order this pillow. It, it flips us over in the middle of the night. We need it. My dad's hilarious. He loves ordering all that stuff. But you know when they've sold you and sold you and sold you, but they haven't gotten to the cost? And you just want to know, how much is this going to cost me? <laughs> how much? $29.99? $19.99. Three payments of $19.99. There you go. Well, the fruit of the Spirit, uh, we all want it. We're sold. We're like, God, take our money. Give us the 1-800 number. We want it. Tell us how to get it. And he's like, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you your flesh. Because it's not the fruit of your flesh. It's the fruit of your spirit. So Amy, doesn't matter how much knowledge I have. Doesn't matter how much experience I have. Doesn't matter how many opportunities I get. That's all Amy. By the flesh, Amy cannot produce the fruit of the spirit. So tending to Amy's needs is not productive. Because when I buy a plant and I look at it, I say, okay, is it partial sun? Is it full sun? How much water does it need? I, I want to know what it needs. If it's going to flourish, I need to know what it needs. So if we are tending the fruit of the Spirit, then in order to produce fruit, we are tending the Spirit. Come on, let that sink in. We come to church so many times and we think that we're supposed to be tending our flesh and grooming our flesh and, and carving on our flesh to try to make it all perfect and right. And God's going, forget the flesh. It will never produce the fruit of the Spirit. Lean in, to tend, to keep something means to lean in. When I have a plant I care about, I'm worried about, I want it to thrive, I watch it, I keep a close eye on it. Oh, that's too much sun, let me move it. Wait, I've never brought this one out of the shade. I believe God is saying to you about your spirit and tending your spirit is, has it been in the shade, is it withered, is it not producing? Because maybe you haven't been bringing your spirit life to work with you. Maybe it needs to be drug out in the sun. What about the water of the word of God? Have you been breaking up the soil? You know, when you, we have a hard heart, when we're hardened, life does that to us. We don't need to apologize for that. God understands that. The parable of the sower tells us. God throws the seed. The word goes out. But, but when there's been a lot of traffic, when it's right by the roadside, when, when we've been beaten down by life, you have to break up that hard ground. Because seed sitting on top of the soil doesn't do anybody any good. 
You want it to soak in? You want to hold on to it? That's what I believe God is calling us to do as a church, is to hold on to things. There's so many bulimic Christians going around church to church, whatever, receiving, I mean, like, bellied up to the buffet, going, feed me, feed me. And then all week, we regurgitate everything we've eaten on Sunday. We vomit all over the world. And God is saying, you're still weak. You're still sickly. You're still frail because I need you to hang on to my word. Hold on to it. Let it do something in you. And honey, when it does, you will be the greatest marketing for a fruitful life. You don't need to regurgitate what you just heard. Hang on to it. Let it do a work in you. Let the seed penetrate your heart. Let it move things. Let it change things. Let it speak for itself. Because a fruitful life does. But what we have to do when we come to the place where we want a fruitful life is go, okay, what does tending look like? It means leaning in. It means looking closely. What is the spirit need in my life to thrive? What does it require? What does it require to walk by the Spirit, to live by the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit? It looks different than being married by the flesh. Being married by the Spirit looks different than being married by the flesh. Parenting by the Spirit looks a lot different than parenting by the flesh. I can firsthand tell you about this because I feel when the Holy Ghost moves on me, I look in the eyes of my children and I speak to what God has put in them. I don't look at their face or their nose or their eyes that looks like me and decide I'm not gonna say anything, I'll wait, and, 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 or, or I won't feel guilty because they didn't get everything that they always wanted or because there's been divorce in a family, I, I'll make excuses and give them whatever they want because they've suffered pain. No, I, I don't care about their flesh. I look at them by the Spirit and say, God has put us on assignment on this planet together for a purpose and your spirit has no age, honey. And I am called here to call the great things out of you. So when I look at you and I speak to you, it is spirit to spirit. It is not mother to child. Stand up. Raise yourself up. Call the greater things out. Lean in. Lean in. Stand with me, if you will. This week, we were on a vacation together, and we were with a, a lot of people in that environment that were hurting, and I felt it. I used to think when I was a teenager, when I dealt with depression, that it was about me and my life. If you're dealing with depression, this is gonna to speak to you right now because if you are, it's, it's because you're a receiver. You have an antenna that everybody doesn't have, okay? So when you feel oppression and depression and you look inward and you think it's about your life and your circumstance, you're on the wrong track. Can I put you on the right track? Just like the dog-eared antennas right now, I'm gonna move them around for you, all right? We're gonna put a foil on the end and help you out. <laughs> and when I was on this boat with our family this week, I found myself was feeling such a, an oppression. There was, a, there was a community of people on this boat just hurting. I mean, just there just to hook up and whatever else goes on on a cruise ship that, you, you know, ungodly things, and I just felt it. And, uh, and I, I thought it was me at first. I always think it's me and something's wrong with me or my life or there's a shoe gonna drop or I'm gonna find out something. And, and the Lord led me back to, Amy, you know what it feels like to tend the spirit. I sat on the balcony and I thought I was all by myself. It was the only place I could go where I could really cry out to the Lord. And I was on the balcony and I just did what I know how to do. I did this. I just said, Lord, I need you. I need you, Lord. I heard my grandma Hayes saying it when I said it. It works every time. Jesus, I need you. I love you. You told me you'd never leave me or forsake me. I feel alone right now. I need you now. I need you right here on this balcony. I need you now. Holy Spirit, I need you now. There's hurting people in this place. I need to feel your power. They need to encounter you. I need you now. As I was crying out to the Lord, the oppression began to lift. I felt such a breakthrough. 
And a bald man with glasses leaned around the balcony and gave me a very odd look. I thought I was alone until that moment. And I remembered then, you know what, I'm commissioned to tend the Spirit. I'm commissioned. If I want the fruit of the Spirit, I have to tend the Spirit. And the Spirit, what the Spirit needs is for me to open my mouth and to shift the atmosphere. If there's oppression, if there's a weather system around me in the Spirit, God has already planted the Word of God. If you don't have to know the whole Pentateuch and have the Old Testament memorized, all you need is one promise He's given you. And for me in that moment, I felt alone, I felt isolated, I felt cut off. And I needed to have church on my balcony. And all I did was open my mouth and say, God, you said you'd never leave me. You said you'd never forsake me. I need you right now. Father, we need your presence right now. In every circumstance, in every situation, we lean in to your spirit. We look at what's growing in our life. And Father, we ask that you attend, that you break up the fallow ground in Jesus' name, that the hard hearts around us are broken up, that our own heart is made fertile in your presence. We thank you for your word, God, like water that softens the, the impenetrable parts of our lives. We thank you, Father, right now for the authority on every believer in this room to open their mouth, and when they do, to open the seed packet you've given them, the access, the currency of the kingdom. See, God has given you something that everybody you encounter in the world doesn't have. You have a bridge yes. to open dimensions. Yes. You can move in and out anytime you want. Yeah. So when somebody pulls out in front of you and they're, they're, they're rude and they're obnoxious, they're hateful, they're prejudiced, they're ignorant, whatever they are, they don't have what you have. Yeah. So you can't put an accountability or requirement on them because you have access to an inheritance and a currency from a kingdom they are not connected to. So they are not held in accountability for the fruit of the Spirit. You are. So this is on you. You're supposed to access heaven and say, God, I, I, I'm, sh I'm running short. I'm running out of gas. Is there another fuel tank? Can you download love, joy, and peace? Can you, can you fill my seed bag right now? So that what I have doesn't come from my own environment, but it comes from a place where ancient things know how to grow. Ancient things know how to break ground. There's a groundbreaking anointing in this room right now, but a desperation has to come over you for your situation where you can open your mouth and you can change things. You can say some things. costs our flesh and sometimes it's embarrassing I may not have a good voice to sing but leaning in tending the spirit it's baby steps you think and the enemy has convinced you that you need these quantum leaps in order to get in position to receive what God has for you you don't it's baby steps you are just a few connections away from the most fruitful life you have ever had. Are you ready for a reinvention? Are you ready for a new season? I wanna be fruitful tomorrow, and because I wanna be fruitful tomorrow, I know I can't bribe, I can't buy, I can't squeeze it out at the last minute. That means that right now my job is to break up the hard things. It's to cultivate. My job is to dig around the roots. My job is to empty myself of flesh, to prune away things that are getting in the way. My job is to make more room for the spirit. Because if we were talking about losing weight right now, you would know I need to lower my calories. I need to up my movement. You know it's addition and subtraction. Anything you choose to tend to that you want to tend, it's going to always require addition of something and subtraction of something. 
The enemy wants you to believe it's so complicated and these spiritual matters are too much for you. They're not too much for you. Some of you are feet, I mean steps away, steps away from encountering the spouse that God has for you, that you've been praying for. You've been faithful in delay, but God is saying, don't give up. Don't let your heart get hardened. Keep yourself cultivated. Be ready to receive. Step up when everybody else steps back. Be present in this season. Lean into the Spirit. And sometimes leaning into the Spirit is, is always, not sometimes, it's always going to be at the cost of your flesh. It's gonna feel inconvenient. It's gonna feel uncomfortable. I decided I stopped doing comfortable a long time ago because there's no thrill like living on the edge. And if you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much space. God's called us, live on the edge. Push the boundaries of what's possible in your life. Other people might look at you and say, you know what, you're too old for fruitfulness. You've passed your season, you have not. You are just entering the most beautiful year of your life. Take hold of it, believe it, receive it. When you receive it, the fruit of your lips should reflect what you receive, okay? So you begin to declare, this is the most fruitful year of my life. This is the most bountiful, abundant year of my life. We speak cursing to every weed, to everything that would come in, try to take up space in the garden of our heart. And we thank you, Father, for the elevation, for the thriving, for the fruitful season. We embrace it and we lean in. This week, I want you to picture yourself when you're in the car, when you're driving. The passenger is the plant that represents the spirit in your life. How well is the spirit doing? When you enter a restaurant, when you're in a water cooler conversation, you have to say, is my spirit thriving in this surrounding, in this environment? Is this good for the fruit of the spirit to be produced or is this an environment that I need to change? I'm gonna lean in, I'm gonna tend the spirit so that I can produce the fruit of the spirit. Let me pray for you this morning. Father, I thank you for the groundbreaking anointing. I thank you for the word that is like water that penetrates and produces the fruit that you desire from our lives. And God, we thank you that we can fall in line through humility and say, we know by the flesh we cannot produce kindness, patience, and goodness but by your will and through your way, we submit our lives to you. We give, we give ourselves completely to you and we ask, Lord, that you heighten our discernment. When we feel feelings of oppression and depression and di disturbances around us, that you bring our understanding to a place and tune our spirit to what's really going on, that we join the rank and fight alongside our brother and sisters for a groundbreaking anointing, for new territory, that we recognize when somebody is racially prejudiced and they slur against us, they, they throw hate at us, that we stand and represent a kingdom where there is no slave and there is no free. We are all redeemed. Father, we thank you that we represent you. And in those moments, we are taking territory from the enemy. We see ourselves as ambassadors of the kingdom, bearers of good fruit. And God, I thank you right now that in every relationship where there's been damage, where the fruit of the spirit has been neglected, it's been missing, that you give us a fresh start. You give us an opportunity in Jesus' name to produce the fruit that remains. We thank you for it. We're gonna take the opportunity you give us, not for granted, but we're gonna take it and use it. I thank you, God, that I see children this week humbling themselves to their parents, coming to their parents and, and opening that door for that deep spiritual connection and conversation. God, I thank you that every parent 
needs, no, needs not to fear. You'll give them the right words. You're gonna speak prophetically and it'll make room for the gifts of the Spirit. We thank you, Father, right now for every marriage that's in turmoil. I thank you for a new chance. I thank you for forgiveness. I thank you for a love, God, that you've supernaturally given us. We wouldn't even have salvation if it wasn't for your forbearance and patience with us. And because we've received patience, God, we give that in the form of forgiveness. God, we ask that you renew trust where there has been broken trust in relationship. I thank you, Father, that you mend the bridges for us, that your spirit goes before us and makes the crooked places straight in Jesus' name, and that you raise up the valleys in Jesus' name. Those hard roads that are in front of us, you make them straight. You make the way easy for us in Jesus' name. We thank you for what you're doing by the Spirit, and we continue to bless your name and lean in as we tend your Spirit in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I love you, Covenant Church. I'll see you next Sunday or Saturday for Flourish. God bless you.